Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, as always, go check out realliferpharmacology.com. Go subscribe there. Get your free PDF on the top 200 drugs. Uh, great resource. Absolutely no cost to you. Uh, just simply an email and, and we'll get you updates when we have new podcasts and other content available. So again, realliferpharmacology.com. You can get that free uh, 31-page PDF. Lots of content in there. So uh, go check that out. And with that, uh, let's get into the drug of the day today. Uh, we're going to talk about pantoprazole. Uh, brand name of this medication is Protonix. And in clinical practice, I definitely see this medication used uh, fairly frequently. Uh, it is a PPI, uh, that is a proton pump inhibitor. And this uh, drug inhibits the hydrogen potassium ATP pump uh, in parietal cells in the stomach. Ultimately, that leads to less acid in the stomach and a rise in pH in the stomach. As you can expect, uh, when we reduce acid in the stomach, uh, we're having an antacid type effect. So that's kind of a general uh, broad classification in addition to the PPI classification. Um, but as you can expect, uh, this medication is... Uh, going to be used for heartburn and various conditions like that. So uh, GERD, uh, peptic ulcer disease, Barrett's esophagus. Uh, it's used for uh, GI protection in elderly patients. Uh, I see that as a common indication. So uh, patients who maybe need uh, chronic NSAIDs, for example, uh, they um, may be put on uh, a drug like uh, pantoprazole to potentially uh, protect the, the GI tract and reduce uh, the risk of, of GI ulceration. Uh, stress ulcer prophylaxis in the hospital, so this drug comes uh, IV and NPO, uh, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, so uh, lots of different kind of GI purposes uh, that I've, I've certainly seen uh, pantoprazole and the PPIs in general uh, used for as a, a class there. Uh, adverse effect profile. Um, in the short term, I typically in clinical practice don't see a lot of issues uh, with the PPIs in general or a pretty low incidence of, of common adverse effects. Um, any type of GI changes, um, constipation, diarrhea, um, headaches been reported, um, but again, not, not to a, a large percentage or a large extent of, of patients, um, but just kind of something to think about in the, the short term there. I would say more often than not, clinicians are more worried about uh, the potential for longer term risks, which again, generally aren't crazy high, um, but maybe a little bit more significant uh, issues that, that we may run into there. So um, first one I, I want to mention that's been reported in the literature is an increased risk of, of fracture. Um, so again, the higher dosages, uh, the longer the patient's on it, um, potentially the, the more risk that that patient's going to, to be. And obviously, when you're looking at patients, you want to review and look for osteoporosis risk factors. Um, you know, are they a, a, a elderly female? Um, are they on, you know, long-term prednisone for some reason or a corticosteroid? Um, you want to look at those osteoporosis risk factors um, in addition to uh, the potential additive risk that a long-term uh, PPI uh, may cause as it's, as it's added and, and used. So um, that's really one of the, the big reasons, at least in, in my mind, um, along with a few others, why we try to um, minimize the use of PPIs and we try to limit it to durations where possible. But there are definitely certain conditions like Barrett's esophagus um, where we're going to likely use PPIs long term. So again, always kind of this risk versus benefit um, type of, of calculation that should be assessed, monitored, um, as the patient is taking that therapy. And um, as a general rule of thumb, somebody on, on long-term uh, PPI use, you know, if, if you're seeing that patient periodically, 
uh, every six months to a year might be a, a good idea to, to kind of reassess. Uh, I've seen a lot of patients in, in my clinical practice where um, maybe they were put on an NSAID and then they were having GI issues and so uh, they, they wanted to continue the NSAID and maybe we added a PPI. Well, maybe five months, 10 months, a year down the road, um, maybe that pain that they were using the NSAID for has resolved and we can back off, potentially discontinue the NSAID. Well, think about it from a prescribing cascade standpoint. We added that PPI likely because of the NSAID. So maybe we can get rid of the pantoprazole that we're trying to use. So got to think about those long-term things. Got to think about why the drug was added initially. Um, and, and continually reassess these medications, um, particular to, particularly to reduce uh, some of those longer-term risks, like the, the fracture risk. Uh, other risks that certainly have been associated uh, with the use of, of pantoprazole and PPIs, um, increased risk of C. diff, so that's a, a diarrhea-causing um, infection. Um, other things to think about. Uh, low magnesium. So if you see a patient on magnesium supplements and you see that they're on a PPI, um, you can, you know, potentially think about the fact that the PPI might be causing uh, magnesium deficiency. Uh, same thing with B12. Uh, PPIs and, and pantoprazole definitely been associated with B12 deficiency. Uh, so that's definitely something to think about if a patient uh, presents with anemia and B12 deficiency. Um, make sure that pantoprazole uh, isn't causing that issue, and um, if we can potentially uh, get them off that pantoprazole, that could be um, advantageous. Again, always got to weigh the, the risks versus um, the benefits of being on the therapy or off the therapy. Uh, there has been other some uh, some other rare things associated potentially with PPIs, um, hypersensitivity reaction, uh, almost a lupus type reaction interstitial nephritis. Uh, again, those things are, are very, very rare, um, but because so many people are sometimes on these medications, those those rare things might um, creep up into to practice a little bit. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and I'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material, like ambulatory care, BCMTMS, BCPS, geriatric certification, uh, if you're a pharmacy student looking for NAPLEX content, go check out all the resources, meded101.com slash store. Uh, in addition, we've got books for other healthcare professionals that may be beneficial on case studies, drug interactions. Uh, so if you're a nurse, med student, PA, nurse practitioner, uh, definitely lots of different resources there um, in paperback books, in ebooks. Uh, as well as Audible books as well. And uh, I've still got that deal with Audible uh, where you can get your first Audible book for free if you've never tried it. So uh, I've got a few Audible books available. Um, you can get six, eight, ten hours of content, depending upon the book you're looking at, uh, absolutely for free. Um, and there's a lot of case studies and clinical pearls uh, that I share um, that I've seen in, in my practice. So again, everything, meded101.com slash store. All right, so let's finish up with drug interactions. Uh, first one that that comes up, or I would say the one I get asked about most commonly, is clopidogrel and pantoprazole, potentially more so than other PPIs, may have less impact on reducing the effectiveness of clopidogrel compared to, let's say, omeprazole, which is probably the other most commonly used PPI. So... Um, it's, it's one of those things that's, that's kind of a clinical gray area still. We've, we've had some evidence, uh, saying yes, it, it does reduce the effectiveness of clopidogrel and, and others, um, saying no, it doesn't. Um, and obviously clopidogrel being used for, uh, something like heart attack or stroke prevention, um, definitely is a, a significant drug there. So, uh, again, uh, uh, my focus, uh, when I see a PPI used with, uh, clopidogrel um, is saying, hey, can we get rid of that PPI potentially? So looking at the use, the indication, um, is it possible to get rid of that PPI? If it's not, um, and maybe they're on omeprazole, 
Uh, it might be a situation where uh, I'm thinking about uh, whether Brotonix might be an acceptable alternative that maybe, again, evidence isn't 100% solid, but maybe pantoprazole interacts a little bit less uh, than, than omeprazole. So that's kind of my thought process uh, with that drug interaction. Again, first and foremost on the top of my mind is, hey, can we reduce or get rid of the PPI? Is that possible? And if that isn't possible, um, then we look at some of those other risk mitigation strategies. Uh, PPIs in in general, um, as they impact um, acid secretion and raise the pH, uh, that can potentially impair iron absorption. Um, whether or not it's clinically significant, you're probably just going to monitor iron stores over time. If you know a patient uh, needs iron supplementation and they've been deficient, um, that's probably the best strategy there or the most common strategy. Um, Also, bisphosphonates um, can potentially uh, be impacted a little bit. So your drugs like lendronate, for example, Um, their action uh, can potentially be reduced potentially with PPIs, uh, particularly if they're given together or close together, uh, maybe even more prominent there. Uh, Some of the cephalosporins, uh, cefiroxime uh, is a a bad one that can be impacted by um, a higher pH in the stomach or in the GI tract in general, and absorption may be altered significantly there. Cefpodoxime is another one. I don't see it used terribly often. I'd say I see cefiroxime used a little bit more in clinical practice, uh, but there's another cephalosporin that could potentially be impacted uh, from the absorption standpoint. Uh, Azole antifungals, there's a few interactions with that. Uh, Again, kind of absorption variation changes uh, based upon the use of uh, PPI like pantoprazole. Uh, Methotrexate concentrations can potentially be increased um, and then a couple other things I, I wanted to, to kind of circle back to a little bit um, is low magnesium and low B12. So um, starting with low magnesium, while technically not a tr- true classic drug-drug interaction, um, we've got to think about those medications that can cumulatively uh, add to a low magnesium situation. So a classic example would be a loop diuretic with a PPI. Um, we could have some cumulative additive effects uh, on lowering that magnesium level. And B12, same thing. Um, If a patient has type 2 diabetes, they're likely on metformin, or it's very commonly used. Um, Metformin can lower B12 levels, and PPIs like pantoprazole can lower them as well. So kind of thinking about some of the cumulative effects um, that use, using drugs that cause similar effects can have on a patient, uh, I think is really, really important to uh, recognize and obviously address and monitor uh, as indicated there. All right, so that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, Very, very appreciative to those of you who have done that. Um, Share us with classmates, colleagues, anybody uh, who could benefit from pharmacology education. Help us uh, continue to to grow the podcast. Uh, And of course, uh, your direct support at the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, S-T-O-R-E helps fund this podcast, uh, helps keep it available uh, free uh, and, and for all to uh, benefit from. So again, thank you all so much for the support. I uh, can't, can't thank you guys enough. And uh, I'm going to sign off for today.